my name is Chrissy. I'm a life skills and deployment educator at Fleet and Family Support Center in San Diego. I'm here today to respond to a request for a self-esteem course. I'm going to cover two concepts from that course, but I encourage you to reach out to one of our contacts at Fleet and Family and see if we can send you some additional handouts or self-assessments, which can be really helpful in this course. So the two concepts that I wanna cover are first, the six pillars of self-esteem from Nathaniel Brandon's book, and then a Johari window, which we'll talk a little bit about self-awareness, which is very important in self-esteem as well. So I'd like to start with the six pillars of self-esteem. The first one is the practice of living consciously. Now, if you've seen any of these other videos, particularly with me, I like to talk about mindfulness in relation to a lot of other life skills courses. If you're practicing mindfulness, you are also living consciously. Mindfulness is basically the art of living in the present moment, bringing your mind and your focus and your attention to what you are currently experiencing or what you are currently, um, currently doing. So if I take two people, for example, I take someone who's kind of living in their own thoughts and their own narrative, all of the terrible things that are going to happen in their future and all of the bad things that have happened in their past, that person is not living consciously. Whereas if someone who is living consciously wakes up, uh, is thankful for uh, the gift that they have of that day, um, is generally aware of what's happening with when they're eating, walking, having a conversation with someone, paying attention to what it's like to go about their daily work schedule, a person that's living in the present moment and living consciously is going to be working towards the first steps of becoming and becoming more self-aware and having more self-esteem. So living consciously can help us in a lot of ways. It also has mindfulness also has a lot of great benefits for people who experience symptoms of anxiety, depression, and just an overall sense of a lack of purposelessness. Okay, so our purposefulness. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next one, which is the practice of self-acceptance. Okay, so I don't know anybody, maybe you do, but I haven't met a perfect person yet. Okay, so we want to think about self-acceptance and what does that look like? So, for example, now, I've never been active duty, I'm a spouse, um, but I'm a mother, I've had three children. Um, old Chrissy, before the three kids and three sections, is not the same as new Chrissy. Um, new Chrissy, after three kids and the C-sections is not the same. I have different changes to my body, I think about things differently, I have new responsibilities. I can accept those changes in my life and realize what I can control and what I cannot control, lose the narrative of comparing myself to other people in different situations, and just allow myself to move forward. Now sometimes self-acceptance gets a bad rap for thwarting the progress with self-improvement. That's not the same. Now, for example, I'll just use working out as an example or personal health. If I don't like my post-baby physique, there are things I can change about it, mainly to deal with my movement, my exercise habits, and my eating habits. I can change that. I cannot probably change the scars on my body or the new responsibilities I have, but I can have help with those responsibilities if I reach out to the right entity. So realizing what you cannot change and accepting the things that, um, that you can't. So you allow yourself to be okay with what you can't change and move forward with the things that you can. Self-acceptance. So the next one is the practice of self-responsibility. So accepting responsibility for myself, my feelings, my actions. This is the next step in self-esteem. The practice of self-responsibility daily. So I'm responsible for my choices, for my actions, my emotions to some, some degree and extent. I cannot make excuses or play the victim for the situation that I am because I am responsible. I'm the only thing in life that I control, me, myself, and I. 
So think too about the ways that you can accept responsibility um, and how this can relate to your relationships. All right, so self-responsibility is the next one. Um, I'll give a personal story with this one just to drive down the point. Uh, I have a lot of responsibility for people, or a lot of um, empathy right now for anyone who has experienced um, loss of work or a loss of income um, during this global pandemic. During the last financial crisis um, in 2008, I lost my job. I was just new to an organization. I was the last one in the door, so I was the first one out when people when people were being laid off. And it, I did actually feel very victimized by that. I felt like I had done all the things that I was supposed to do. Um, I was trying to support my new fiance, soon to be husband. I was trying to do the right things and I it didn't work out for me. So I went through periods where I felt very victimized. But once I realized that I did have some responsibility, that I could change some of the situations that I had, I then was able to move forward and, and get to a place where I wanted to be. And it did affect my self-esteem, okay? Getting laid off does not feel good. It doesn't make you feel good about your self-esteem at all. But realizing that you have some responsibility and that you can't make excuses um, to not move forward. So let's go on to the fourth pillar. The fourth pillar is practicing self-assertiveness. Self-assertiveness. Now, assertiveness is different than um, aggressive, okay? So being assertive means that you recognize and um, acknowledge your core values, the things that make you uniquely who you are, and you live towards those. And when you feel like your life is not aligned to your core values, you can make the changes in your life. So people that do not um, practice self-assertiveness don't um, stand up for their convictions and they're easily swayed. So if you're ever in a group and you feel like you are changing yourself to fit that group to get other people's acceptance, you are not going to have a good self-esteem about yourself. You That is not aligned with each other. Um, so realizing too, that you need to acknowledge your real convictions and your real feelings um, and allow yourself to practice that without offending or judging other people. So that's just saying, hey, that's okay for you. Um, maybe that works for you, but this is that doesn't jive with me. That's not who I really am. So drawing that line too, because it can uh, sound very judgmental for someone to say, hey, I don't want to go and do uh, this with that group because I'm better than this and I don't do that. It's just more like That's okay. You can go do that. That's just not living to my core values My core values are more aligned with that and you might need some help understanding what your core values I'm thinking most um, Things specifically about some young adults and I can't say that when I was in my early 20s or uh, 18 19 that I knew what my core values were I had an idea because I could listen to what my inner voice was saying but I didn't necessarily know what those were in stone. So having an idea of what that can be can be really helpful in the next steps towards self-esteem. Um, we actually do have a, an assessment on values, so if that's something that um, you're interested in, reach out to us for that and I can provide you with that assessment and some follow-up um, training along with that, okay? So I'll see you for the next session, part two of self-esteem. Bye.